So following our brief introduction in history, we can go over to what is known as the instruction set architecture. So what are the objectives of a microprocessor? First of all, to transfer stored data. Second of all, to operate on that data. And finally, to make decisions based on the values or the outcomes of an operation. Correspondingly, there are three categories of instructions that really take um, our heart model by Patterson and, Patterson and Hennessy and um, enable them. They're data transfer instructions. They move data within the systems and exchange data with external devices. There's flow of control instructions, which determine the execution order of instructions. And there's arithmetic and logic operations, which are the computational capabilities and functionality of the microprocessor. So the instruction set architecture is the set of instructions and concepts that provide an interface between the software and, hard and hardware. It's the contract between the programmer and the hardware designer. So if we take our kind of stack of where we are in computers, you know, we can start from the bottom where we have the physics, the electrons, and make devices out of them and logic gates and build the microarchitecture. From the top, we have some sort of problem we want to solve. We de de devise an algorithm to solve it. We write a programming language where we can implement the algorithm in, and we have some sort of system that can run the programming language. Well, in between the two, the thing that connects the two of them is the instruction set architecture, the ISA. In a von Neumann architecture, instructions, as we said, are just another piece of data. Therefore, an instruction is just a data word. It's a, be a vector of bits. For example, in RISC-V, instructions are always 32 bits wide. So the bits of data encode all the necessary data to carry out the instruction. For example, we have an opcode. The opcode is an encoding of the name or the type of instruction. So each type of instruction will have a separate opcode. Then we have the operands. Those are the sources or the inputs and the destinations or the outputs of such an operation. We may have immediates, which are hard-coded constants that are used as inputs to the operation. And we may have other information, all kinds of metadata, additional encodings that can affect the control, flow, operation, and additional features of the operation. So for example, let's look at a type of instruction such as uh, maybe an add instruction. In the add, we might have a destination register and two source registers. So the destination register is going to get the sum of the two source registers. And that could be implemented with some sort of encoding of the bits. For example, as we said here in RISC-V, we have 32 bits, where we would uh, um, assign some of the bits to be the opcode, some of the bits to point at what the destination register is, some of them to be the first operand, and the second one the second operand. I'm going to take a side note over here and just look at memory at a very, very simplified high view for right now. We're going to look at memory in depth later on in the course. But this is just something basic that I want to uh, point out so we can, we can understand the rest of the concepts I'm going to be going over. So um, the two things that we're going to discuss are registers, which are in green over here, and memory, which is in this kind of brown. Okay, so registers are basically flip-flops. They can be latches or other types of things as well, but we're going to uh, assume right now that they're flip-flops. And memory, which can be many different types of technologies, for now we're going to assume it's made out of SRAM. And they're both typically synchronous, and they have what we call one cycle latency, kind of. I mean, the flip-flops uh, don't exactly, but it takes us a cycle to write to them, and we also use uh, them inside a cycle for reading. They don't take longer than that. Okay, so we need one clock edge to perform either a read or write to both registers and memory. That's the typical case. Um, of course, there are many different uh, differentiations from this. But registers have many, many advantages over memory. So when we access an SRAM, we're accessing a whole block of data. And that's going to take us uh, close to a whole clock cycle, maybe sometimes more than a whole clock cycle. Um, however, when we go to registers, they're going to take much less than, than a clock cycle. They're going to be something similar to a, a logic gate. So we can perform other operations before or after the register access. Um, the other thing is that several registers can be accessed simultaneously. What we have usually is our register files are going to be multi-ported. Well, um, with an SRAM, we're going to be usually using single-ported SRAM. So we can really only address one um, memory location at a single time for reading or for writing. Register access requires lower power than memory access. So again, it's going to be beneficial to do more um, accesses on registers than accesses on memory. So really, we want to use registers more than we want to use memory. Unfortunately, registers are much bigger than memory bit cells. And therefore, we can only have a limited number of registers. So that was a quick side note and a real simplified view. And now let's go back to what um, we're discussing in our instruction set architecture. And we're going to tell you that most modern architectures are based on general purpose registers. So they're general purpose register ISAs. 
And the architecture, uh, this type of architecture, uses what we call data path registers for its operands. This is an opposed to different architectures such as stack architectures or accumulator architectures, which I'm not going to go into right now. The, it's usually uh, faster and easier for compilers to deal with this type of a GPR ISA. Um, there's another thing called the ABI, or the Application Binary Interface, which is kind of another level on top of the ISA, which is a, a, um, uh, a uh, kind of a contract, an additional contract, an addendum to the contract we have. And these two things provide a set of processor registers that will take different registers, such as here in the RISC-V, we have 32 basic integer registers that you can see. They're called X0 to X31. The ABI gives them additional names, um, and, and the names give them a typical job that the computer compiler should use when, or, or the programmer when you're programming an assembler should use when assigning them things. And these types of registers or the, what the ABI can define are things like general registers, um, R1, R2, R3, these can be general registers that can be used maybe for anything. We have a register, a special register in almost all ISAs, I guess, that would be the program counter that says what the next, uh, you know, points to where the next instruction is. We'll have things like the stack pointer and frame pointer, which I'll discuss in a few minutes, and all kinds of other things, as you can see here for the RISC-V ABI. And it's important to point out that there's no magic number of what the right number of registers is. You know, they can have different numbers of these general purpose registers or these data path registers. In x86, for example, at least in the early versions, you had eight registers. In the earlier versions of ARM, you used to have 16 registers. RISC-V, it has 32 base registers. There's also um, floating point registers if we implement the floating point extension. So our first type of instructions, the first category that we mentioned, were data transfer instructions. And data transfer instructions are responsible for moving data around inside the processor and for bringing data in from the outside world or sending data out. Many modern RISC machines are what we call load store architectures. I mentioned this before. What it means is that we load data from memory to registers in order to compute on the data. Once we get the result, we're going to write it back to a register. And then we can take that register and store it back in memory. So first, we're going to load from memory into a register. Then we're going to store the result from register into the memory. The only accesses to the memory are through explicit load or store instructions. So an example of, of these types of instructions would be something like this. In order to load data from memory uh, to a register, we would use something like load R1 address. So we would provide an address to the memory and say store that in um, one of the registers. So we would go to this memory address and store it inside a memory. Then we can store the address um, from a register to the memory. So something like this, store R1 to an address. Whatever the, the content of R1 is, store it at the, in the memory address that's specified here. So we would take whatever is inside the, the, um, the, C, the, the register, and we would store it back into the memory. So we're only allowed to access the memory with these kind of, I would say, simple instructions. All the computations will be done inside the registers themselves. So there are various uh, memory access addressing modes that you can have, and I'm just going to go over some of the most common ones over here quickly. So direct addressing means that we put a constant inside our instruction itself. The compiler actually figures out what that constant should be, and the constant is the address of the memory that we want to access. So for example, we want to load some sort of a memory address into register R1. We will define the address inside the, the instruction itself. So you can see here, if this is the instruction, we'll say what the register is, which is over here. That's going to be the destination. We'll define the constant. That's going to be a address. We'll go to the memory at that address, take the data, and store it at the destination. Um, it has a problem here because the size of the constant is limited according to the size of the actual address we have. So if we want to, for example, access uh, um, a 32-bit memory space, but we have um, instructions that are only 32-bit wide, we have no room to put things like the, uh, the opcode or the register. So that can be limited. Th that, therefore, um, a common way to do it is using register indirect addressing. In this case, what we do is we um, give as an operand a, a register, which the register holds the um, address to be accessed. So in this case, for example, we have two registers here. R1 will still point to where we want to store the data that's taken from memory. But R2 will point to a different register. That register will store the address that we want to access. So it's indirection. We first go over here, then we address it like this, and then we take the data that was stored over there and we store it into our destination. There is also a saying that everything in computer architecture can be solved with indirection. 
A third one is called displacement or indexed addressing. And in that case, what we do is we don't only provide two um, registers as, as operands, but we also provide some sort of a constant that is given by the compiler. And so in this case, what we do is we go to a, a base memory address and some sort of a, a displacement or some sort of index. So in this case, again, R1 will point to our destination register, and R2 will point to a register which will have a complete address such as a 32-bit address in there. But then the constant... Uh, so we'll go over to this memory address using, um, you know, the, the, the value that was stored in R2. But the constant will tell us, jump forward a couple of memory addresses in order to get the data. And the data that's over there stored in R1. And this is very, very commonly used. And the reason is that things such as arrays usually have a pointer to the beginning of the array. And then we index the array with some offset from that uh, initial pointer. The same could be said as the stack, as we'll see, uh, as we'll see a bit later. So um, displacement or indexed addressing is very, very very common. And finally, just one that I'm pointing out, which isn't really uh, used over here, but we do use it for other things inside uh, different uh, ISAs that we might look at, would be something like count, uh, program counter relative addressing. So it's similar to the displacement or index addressing, but our base address is going to be wherever our program counter is. So we know it, uh, specifically where we're running right now because it's stored inside our program counter, and we give some sort of a constant that's going to be relative to where we are in the program counter. So we don't store um, the the uh, the base address inside of some one of our general purpose registers. We store it. Uh, we use the program counter as the base address, and then we give a constant to take our offset from over there. Um, just I want to point out that Risk Five, looking at all the different types of memory addressing uh, access addressing modes, decided to only implement one only implement displacement addressing. Of course, you can implement register indirect addressing using displacement addressing by giving a constant of zero over here. And you can do um, almost everything basically using this type of a, uh, a displacement or index addressing. So they decided that it would make uh, the ISA much more simple and the hardware much more simple if we only really um, were to implement uh, one of them. I want to take a side elaboration over here and discuss a very important concept called big endian versus little endian. So if you don't know what big endian or little endian is, then you should go over and read Glover's Travels. Because in this um, book uh, by Gutenberg, we have these big endians who would break their eggs at the large end. This is the primitive way. Okay, So big endians would take their eggs, and in order to eat them, they'd break them at the large end. But the Lilliputin king, he really didn't like this. So he made his subjects, which he called little endians, break their eggs at the small end. That is the proper way. Well, this uh, was taken in order to talk about how do you store data. And there's this big argument about how to store data. Do we store it at the big end or the little end? Are we big endian or little endian? So let's consider the number 1,025. And normally written in 32 bits, we would have something like this. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. That is 1,025 in decimal. Okay? We have two types. We have the big endian. And we have the little endian. So in the big endian, what we're going to do is we're going to store at the first byte, the lowest byte in the address, at byte 0, we're going to store the MSB byte, 31 to 24 bits. And at the, low, at the highest address, we're going to store the um, smaller byte, 7 to 0. With little endian, we're going to do it the opposite way. The smallest byte is going to be stored at byte 0. The biggest byte is going to be stored at byte 1. And this may seem very um, obvious, but it may not seem very obvious. Because when we look at little endian, this looks like the way we should do it, um, right? We have byte 3 is going to be 0, 0, 0, byte 2, 0, uh, 0, 0, 0. And the, the, you know, as you can see it here, the LSB is going to be over here on the right. But actually, in addressing, that's going to come first and that's going to come last. So maybe big endian is the way to do it. And this kind of um, argument has been going on for many, many, many years between computer architects and has caused um, an, an uncountable number of bugs in different programs. So let's see examples of the two things that I, I liked I took from, uh, from Krista Stanovich at Berkeley. So names in China, well, my name in China would be Team and Adam. I would put the big Andy in my last name first, and then my first name versus names in the West. I call myself Adam Team and not Team and Adam. I put my first name first and my last name uh, last. If we take dates in ISO 8601, we put the year first, then the month, then the day. So we put the big part, the year, first, and the little part, the day, last. On the other hand, what we usually do in, in, in Europe, we put the day first, then the month, and then the year. 
And how about eating pizza crust? Well, Donald Trump showed us, I guess, over here how to eat pizza crust from the end when he made a, a commercial for Pizza Hut many years ago. But usually, we eat the skinny part first. This would be considered the normal way. So that was kind of confusing, I think. So let's look at an example. Let's assume that we use a little endian because many computer architectures, such as RISC-V, do use little endian. Other ones, by the way, such as ARM, support both big endian and little endian. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to put byte 0 at the lower address. So if we want to go and do something really simple, we'll just load one byte from um, the address over here. We'll look at the memory over here. We'll go to the address, which is E5000004, and what we'll see in here is that we have um, the, the uh, we, we store inside the number 1A. But what if we want to load a half word? So then um, we give the same address over here, and because we're in little endian, the LSB is going to be at the small end. So what we get is 2B1A. How about loading a whole word, a 32-bit word? Well, again, we addressed 50004, but what we get in the end is 4D3C2B1A. That's in Little Endian, where at the lowest address we have the LSB, and at the highest address we have the MSB. It's kind of opposite, but it kind of makes sense. So which one is right? And that's what the big argument is about. We can view this as holding a sequence of words. So our first word would be 4D3C2B1A. Our second word would be 81706F5E, et cetera, et cetera. So we finished our first uh, level of instructions, which were the data movement instructions. And let's go to the second category, which is flow control instructions. So we're going to util utilize the different addressing modes that I showed before to change the flow control. So in opposed to incrementing the PC by one instruction, which is what we usually do, we're going to keep on jumping forward from uh, the PC is going to go, for example, in risk 5 to PC plus 4, since words are, um, are 32 bits, which is 4 bytes, we're always going to increment the PC by 1. But if we want to, we can change our flow control by just overriding the PC with something that is not PC plus 4. And the first type of those are conditional branches. So if in, we have an if-then-else type of a construct in a high-level language like C, what it's going to do is going to be turned into a branch if equal or if not equal, or a branch if greater than, less than. So we're going to have um, different instructions that will enable us to do this. We run our control flow you know, until a certain point. We take a decision, and then we decide if we should go somewhere else. The second type is what we call non-conditional branches, and we usually call them jumps. So it doesn't matter about the decision point. We're for sure going to jump to a different place. And that is called a jump, or the very commonly used jump and link, which we're going to see soon is, a, a, is a, an instruction that we use in order to call a procedure. When we call a procedure, when we go to a function, we're going to want to continue running at the same place that we, we, we branched um, when we finish running that function. So what we're going to do is we're going to store the return address in a register, and then um, and that is considered linking. So we're going to jump, but we're uh, automatically within the same instruction going to store our return address. Um, for these jumps and for these branches, we usually uh, use labels, and that makes it more readable. So for example, we're going to use something like jump to loop begin. Loop begin is not something that's in binary, right? It's just a, a string over here. And it's not something that's going to be efficiently written inside code. So it's something that we use to make things readable, and it's later going to be replaced by some absolute address during the compilation process. So when we compile, we're either going to get you know, some sort of an absolute addressing or a relative addressing that's going to enable us to take that loop begin and turn it into some binary code. So hopefully, the compiler can make it the most optimal it can. Then we have arithmetic logic instructions. That's our third category. So I'm just going to go over these briefly. Um, something like register, register, arithmetic, which we saw before, is very commonly found in risk machines, in load store machines. So we do something like add. Uh, the destination register and to source uh, operands. So that will be turned into, you know, R3 gets the sum of R1 and R2. So R1 is going to point at first operand, that should be R2, is going to be pointed at the second operand. R3 is going to be pointed at the destination. So the result of that v plus that is going to go into the destination um, register. 
register immediate arithmetic is going to have something where we can we already know that we want to for example increment uh, the registers content by one so we'll put a constant of one here or do something that we know already at compile time so that we we don't have to take two operands from registers we can take r1 be the first source the second one can be that constant that's already encoded inside our instruction and r3 again will be the register to store the result what kind of arithmetic logic commands do we have? Well, the basic ones such as add and subtract, um, extended ones which we don't necessarily have to have but we'll often use, which are multiplies and divides. We may have floating point arithmetic if we decide to make a complex machine with floating point units. Um, logical things such as and, ors, and xors for bit masking and so forth. Shifts, which really enable us to do multiplies by uh, powers of two or div divisions by powers of two. These can be logical or arithmetic. And we can do compares. So we can compare something and do a set if that something is greater than or less than something else. Um, it will uh, turn on a flag or something. So there are different types of arithmetic logic commands that are run inside our arithmetic logic unit.